Hey you guys, Siobhan here just dropping in before the next episode of Knowing Animals. The episode you're about to hear was recorded in Mexico City where I attended the Minding Animals Conference, but we've got a brand new sponsor for the program that I wanted to tell you about before I start the episode proper. So this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by the podcast Species. Now, I know that you're interested in animals because you're listening to the podcast Knowing Animals, and I also know that you're interested in podcasts because you're listening to one. So why not check out the new podcast, Species? Each week, Species considers a different animal and you get an opportunity to learn all about that animal, how they live, their cultural significance, whether they're endangered and much more. I've been listening to the podcast and enjoying it a great deal. Did you know that there were never any snakes in Ireland? I've also been learning about our very own Australian Tasmanian devil. So the program does a different species every week and it also travels around the world. Um, How do you find out about the podcast species? You can go to anywhere where you normally get your podcast from, including the iTunes store, or you can just simply put species, the podcast into Google and it would come up right away. So learn more about animals with a different species each week via the podcast species and enjoy the program. Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan does like knowing animals. Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan does like knowing animals. Hey you guys, welcome to Knowing Animals, the podcast. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. This episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by our dear friends at ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. ASA is the organisation that supports animal study scholars in Australia, in New Zealand and all around the world. ASA does a lot of good work to promote animal studies and to support animal study scholars, but they also need your support. So please think about becoming a member of ASA today. To find out more about membership, you can go to the Australasian Animal Studies Association webpage or look them up on Facebook. That's ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Well, this episode of Knowing Animals is coming to you from Mexico City, beautiful Mexico City, where I'm attending the Minding Animals Conference. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to bring you a superstar special guest this episode. Today I'm joined by Bed Calicott, who is um, a University Distinguished Research Professor at the University of North Texas. No doubt he will be very well known to many listeners. And today we're going to discuss Bird's book chapter, The Environmental Omnivore's Dilemma, which appeared in a book edited by Ben Bramble and Bob Fisher, titled The Moral Complexities of Eating Meat, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2015. Welcome to the podcast, Bed. Thank you very much. So, Glad to be here. Oh, thank you. So, why did you write this chapter? Um, a lot of chapters I write are really by invitation, but this is something that I had actually been thinking about quite a lot, and was uh, the 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 invitation to write the chapter was actually very welcome, and so um, it's part of the c- sort of complex of issues that are at the interface of environment and environmental ethics and animals and animal ethics. Yes, it's interesting because you start off by noting that the journal Environmental Ethics, which I myself have been published in, you you noted that it was starting to publish more about animal ethics than environmental ethics. And you make a strong distinction between those two. How do you differentiate between those two? What are the key differences? Well, this was really a reference to back in 1980 uh, or 1979 when the journal Environmental Ethics was established. And um, 
my impression, actually, uh, upon further review, was inaccurate. The uh, number of animal ethics papers being published in the journal were not as many as I had actually thought they were. But it was important to me to make a sharp distinction between animal ethics and environmental ethics because environmental ethics seem to be motivated by the problems that we identify as environmental, having to do less with individual animals than with species loss, with uh, ecological uh, erosion and uh, destruction of biotic communities, what in general we would call holistic as opposed to individualistic uh, issues. And so right at the very beginning, to make a sharp distinction between the two fields was really um, seemed to me important for the very survival of this very nascent um, and inchoate thing in 1979 and 80 called environmental ethics. Mm. So in the chapter, you're rather critical of both animal liberation and animal rights theories. Can you tell listeners what the basis of your criticism is or what concerns you about those approaches? Uh, the... It, it, First and foremost, I suppose, I'm a philosopher, and so I'm looking at um, animal liberation and animal rights really from the perspective of the um, moral paradigms, the ethical paradigms and the moral philosophy in which they are uh, embedded. And in my view, the paradigms are concerned what I call a kind of essence accident uh, form of reasoning. If you have qua ethics, relevant to ethics, a certain characteristic in the case of animal rights, it's being the subject of a robust or the robust subject of a life. And in the case of um, animal liberation, it's uh, being uh, sentient. And if a being qualifies under those uh, um, uh, essential characteristics, they are in the moral club, and if they do not, they are outside the moral club. But if you're in, then you have full rights and responsibilities, which means that it's a one-size-fits-all ethic, and that seems not to me to really correspond very well with our um, intuitions, and it seems to be counterintuitive. So the sort of communitarian ethic that I'm advocating, based really from my work in environmental ethics, seems to be more nuanced and we can therefore sort of have different ethical relationships with different classes of animals. Yes. So would you say that your work has been influenced somewhat by the emergence of these kind of rights-based or even, you know, the animal protection philosophy, whether it be utilitarian or deontological? Can you see your work changing as these these moral discussions come into play in the 70s and 80s? Uh, my posture, for the most part, was oppositional to these paradigms, not to animal ethics per se, but shall we say animal ethics on my own terms or the terms of the communitarian paradigm that uh, I was uh, advocating. I do not think that it really got much traction within the animal ethics community. It was pretty much ignored. Uh, and, uh, and even I think animal rights, as rather carefully defined by Tom Reagan, has been eclipsed by animal liberation, the sort of Singerian approach as to the Reaganic approach. Mm. So mm. Uh, nevertheless, I kept plugging away at it, and uh, I'm here at this conference actually uh, speaking on the subject tomorrow. Wonderful. So, Bed, it was interesting to read in the book chapter 
about the to and fro between you and Tom Regan, and you've also mentioned it, this to me outside the context mm. of this mm. podcast. And I'm, you know, very familiar with the expression eco-fascist. Yes. But it seems in the book chapter as though um, perhaps it was coined in response to some of your work. If I please correct me if I've misunderstood. But so I'm just hoping you can explain to listeners what that term means and what the debate is around it. Okay. Yes, I think the term eco-fascist was in fact, indeed, uh, uh, coined in response to my work. <laughs> Uh, and um, what it means is really putting uh, an, an emphasis on the whole and subordinating the individual to the good of the whole. Uh, so that seemed to be in line with at least some salient aspects of fascism, and so the term ecofascism was coined. Um, Tom Reagan was the first to actually coin the term, uh, and I am indebted to him for doing so because uh, it, it, no one wants to be an eco-fascist, and it um, stimulated, if not forced me, to think more deeply about the Leopold land ethic and to rescue it from the charge of eco-fascism, but in doing so, what it did was to generalize the... Um, fundamentals or the foundational ideas of the land ethic to actually uh, a, a very uh, broad uh, paradigm um, so that w I was also um, informed by the work of Mary Midgley, a British philosopher who introduced the term the mixed community of humans and animals in addition to Leopold's concept of the biotic community. And so it it really enabled me to think about a, a broad and general communitarian paradigm. So I owe a great deal, a great debt to uh, Tom Reagan for calling me out on that uh, on that issue. Wonderful. Well, Valet Tom Tom Reagan, who mm -hmm. we've been remembering at this conference. So, Bed, one of the questions that you set out to answer in the book chapter is how do domestic animals fit into our moral landscape? Mm -hmm. Can you tell listeners what you conclude? Well, I, again, uh, thanks to Mary Midgley, I'm sort of appropriating her work here in uh, the concept of the mixed community, which should be really mixed communities. And just to take the most uh, obvious and familiar examples, we have uh, essentially brought certain animals, but only certain animals, into our family community. And they have, they seem to be treated as, if not first class, at least second class family members uh, with the duties and obligations uh, that we hold to them and that in many ways they hold to us. But those duties and obligations differ from uh, other mixed communities historically uh, it would be um, horses, for example, who were our companions historically in work and war and now in sport and uh, of various sorts and even to some extent companion animals. And so we have rather different uh, ethical uh, duties and obligations uh, to them. The, the example that I uh, use is that Horse meat uh, for human consumption is against the law in Texas. You can't; it can't be exported to France or any place that does so. And it's not on the basis of any health considerations or animal rights, but rather on the relationship that humans, especially in Texas, uh, have had with with horses, which is different from their relationship with cattle. Yet constituting another mixed community. Mm. So on the basis of this, I can at once say that uh, we the certain animals uh, have historically, domestic animals, been used for human consumption, uh, but at the same time that the factory farm is an abrogation of the historical relationship that we've had with, with those animals. So there's an animal ethic that's involved there as well. Mm. So the factory farm is problematic, but that brings us to the big question, which is, is it morally okay to eat meat? Ironically, in my uh, 
particular uh, approach to animal ethics, uh, n the answer would be no, especially on environmental grounds rather than uh, concerns for uh, animals directly, uh, either in terms of their suffering or their their rights. And that's because animal agriculture is a major contributor to uh, uh, global climate change uh, with the production of methane gases. It is a major um, pollutant in terms of the crops that and, and, and uh, land use and so on. So from practically every perspective, um, animal agriculture is a threat to the environment. So if we, if we be, became vegetarians uh, or vegans and completely eliminated uh, animal agriculture, it would open up land for wild animals and the ecological restoration and the reestablishment and reconstitution of historical biotic communities. So I think the strongest case uh, against animal agriculture comes from a, an environmental perspective. And can you imagine a time where animal agriculture reduces its environmental impact, its negative environmental, environmental impact to a point where you might conclude that it's ethically okay to eat meat or you just think that that's an impossibility? Under present circumstances, with uh, the dire uh, threats to the environment, especially uh, from global climate change, I think that uh, removing a major cause of greenhouse gases is among the most important things that we should focus on. So, um, however, I don't think that that is a is realistic uh, politically, and so I think that now combining. Uh, environmental ethics and animal ethics with increased regulation of animal agriculture uh, in order to make it more humane uh, and more sustainable, that the result will be that the price of animal products will increase, the uh, a number of animals actually being involved in agriculture will also decrease and so that we will have an incremental change. And so this is where traditional animal ethics based upon animal rights, animal liberation, and environmental ethics are converging on a practical level, if not on a theoretical level. Mm. And so, Baird, you've been in this game quite a while mm. and presumably the environmental problems have increased. Yes in that time, do you feel disheartened or do you see um, signs of op reasons to be optimistic? What, how do you feel looking back on, you know, a career in animal in environmental ethics? Well, of course I am disheartened, you know. I think that we've had far less uh, impact uh, in politically and uh, in terms of policy and law than certainly we would have wished or even imagined uh, at, the, at the start. However, I'm not pessimistic. Uh, it's sort of been my stance throughout, I like to put it this way, that there's no survival value in pessimism. And so I describe myself as a desperate optimist. If you're not optimistic, you will not continue to work and to struggle uh, for uh, environmental quality and a, uh, a, and a better world and a better life for, for animals, which, uh, about which I am very passionate as well. Mm, wonderful. Well, Baird, I ask everybody who comes on the podcast to answer five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? I think so. Go ahead. Mm. Now, these are focused towards animal studies, yeah. but I'm happy for you to think of it in terms of animal studies and environmental ethics, whichever kind of you think speaks to the issue most, most fully. Can you recall the piece, first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? Absolutely. It was uh, Animal Liberation, the book review, uh, by Peter Singer of a book edited uh, by Godlovich et al. in 1975. Yeah, wonderful. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? 
Uh, that would be um, animal liberation and environmental ethics back together again, uh, which was published in the early 1980s. I can't remember the exact date. Mm-hmm. I'm sure our listeners will know that piece. If you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? It would have to be Tom Reagan. Uh, it, it, it less in terms of an influence than as a a, a dialectical companion. Uh, and among the very last pieces that he wrote was a, a response to me. Uh, so this was in nineteen thirty. Uh, I mean, uh, twenty thirteen. Lovely. So, what's the most important thing academics can do for animals? Academics can do for animals. Um, I think that what academics can do for animals is what academics do. And I've been criticized for putting it this way. But I think that there is a trickle-down effect in the the theoretical world. I'm uh, not... I'm not a critic of ivory tower work, and Peter Singer has been identified as, I can't remember by whom, one of the 100 most influential people in the world, and it's largely because of his academic writing. That And so here is a, an outstanding example of the way academics can have an important impact. I think all of the progress all of the um, uh, 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 activism uh, has been inspired by Peter Singer's uh, theoretical work. Mm. Wonderful. So if you had the power to change one thing about the human-non-human animal relationship, what would it be? Definitely it would be the uh, elimination of the abomination of factory farming. Mm. Great. So, Baird, what are you working on next? Next, I am actually working on a memoir, uh, and not because I am vain. I am vain, but that's not the reason I'm uh, writing a memoir. It's because I began my um, work in the uh, Southern Civil Rights Movement, and it and and so it was during the th- that time that I was thinking, well. The uh, the idea of civil rights was theorized in the nineteen, uh, I mean, in the in 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 the eighteenth century, and so w- what we are really facing now, and this was as a result of my experience of the nineteen sixties, is an environmental crisis, and we haven't really theorized the relationship of human beings with nature, and so. I began to think, well, to put it in the crudest possible terms, the movement from civil rights to nature's rights. And I would like to chronicle uh, that experience, which is a little bit different a trajectory than most of my colleagues in environmental ethics who came from a kind of uh, personal relationship with nature. I'm a city boy, never really had much wilderness experience and that sort of thing. It was this different path, which I think is it may be interesting to uh, uh, for readers to to trace. Absolutely. Well, Bed, how can people find out more about your work? Well, I have a little website um, that's um, easily uh, searched on the uh, internet, and uh, there is a uh, CV there. Uh, and um, I'm uh, really all over the internet. So if you Google me, there's a dozen um, uh, YouTube uh, videos and that sort of thing that you can uh, look into. So and then go to uh, look at authors um, on Amazon, uh, and a bunch of my work will be available there as well. Fantastic. Well, Bed, thank you so much for coming on Knowing Animals. And thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal studies scholars and environmental ethicists <laughs> about the work about their work. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Knowing underscore Animals or on Facebook at Knowing Animals. Also, don't forget to leave a review on iTunes. Reviews make it easier for other people to find us. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan, and I do like knowing animals. <laughs> <laughs>